Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the first Sunday of Lent, which falls on February 21, 21, ooh, 21, 21, are Genesis 9, 8 through 17. The Psalm is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22, and Mark 1, 9 through 15. I think this is the third time that we've gotten the selection of these opening verses of Mark, uh, Mark's prologue, if you will. And, uh, and one of the things that I was remembering uh, as I was preparing for the podcast was something that I thought was really helpful, uh, Rolf, in several podcasts ago, where you called to mind or reminded us of the importance of verses 14 and 15 uh, in, uh, in Mark, that that really is the kind of the central nugget of what Mark is about. And uh, we, we have two Sundays in Mark and Lent, and then we move into, uh, move into John. But how is it that we hear those particular verses uh, here as we, as, we think about, as we think about Lent? And, uh, and I was uh, reminded again of our, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but uh, those verbs of repent and believe are plural verbs. I think I mentioned this uh, and uh, last time we talked about this and that, that, that how is it that we move into Lent as a community and, and as a communal reality um, when Lent can be terribly individualized and we've talked about that before, but uh, what does it mean to have a community around you that moves into uh, this, this space and time that is, has a kind of focus uh, and has a kind of uh, call to perspective, which is what Lent, uh, repent is, that is very different uh, and as we've used countercultural. So uh, that's, a, I, that's the first thing I wanted to be able to say, just to remind people of that's of what you have mentioned, Rolf, that I think is really uh, important. Uh, I appreciate that, thanks. Uh, I shouldn't do this because it uh, you're, you've gotten us off to such a serious start, but I have to because I'm me. It's a very binary Sunday, isn't it? Because it's two, two, one, two, one. Just very, very binary. Um, that's not good. So anyway, okay, back to serious. You had um, to do it, you had yeah, to do it. <laughs> um, you think, uh, I like the I like both of those emphases. First of all, the verbs are plural because um, Jesus is speak. Uh, Jesus is calling a different kind of community into being. Jesus is, and Matt talked about this uh, in his uh, one of his dear working preachers. Uh, in the, the, the call to action, but it's a it's through Christ's actions he is enacting is uh, repetitive. So I don't want to say that, but but he is bringing into being a different kind of community, right? A, a, a counter-cultural community. And the verbs are, so it's the time is fulfilled. And that time apparently is, um, you know, the, the, the lid is off the can in terms of time by the arrest of John is what does it. Uh, and uh, the verbs uh, usually translated as repent and believe. Um, and, and which I, the more I think about them, they're just, those are the traditional translations are not helpful uh, to me. Uh, repent is really what Ash Wednesday is about with the Hebrew word shuv that we had in Joel and then the story connected with the liturgical action of Psalm 51, to return to God, to repent. The, um, the Greek word here, metanoia, you know, uh, have your mind blown, be of, a, you know, be of a new way of thinking as part of this new reality that, that the, the kingdom is, that Christ is bringing into being and trust or something uh, rather than believe because believe is, is such a, in the American uh, uh, modern English epistemology. It's such a, uh, as I often say, it has become such a um, noetic exercise of giving intellectual assent to the right theological propositions and trust gets maybe away from that a little more. Um, but I also just like the concept of time. Lent is time as, uh, as I, as I say every year now that, 
what Lent is, is a season of the church year. So it's a time in which to attune our bodies to this different reality. Well, and when you think that both of those verbs too are present tense, you know, believe and repent and believe. And so it, this is not a one time, this is like, keep on, uh, keep on, keep your perspective on uh, this, this, this new kingdom that has, uh, that has been fulfilled, this time has been fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near both perfect tense. Uh, so that that reality of something's happened, but then that that happening is uh, an ongoing present reality. So repentant yeah, practices, exactly. Leaning and so, into, as you said, Wednesday. yeah. And so this repenting is this, like you said, this changing of your transforming of your perspective to see that 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 the kingdom has come near and is here. Uh, and what difference does it make? And that make, and then that trusting in the gospel. Uh, we'll 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 be talking about gospel uh, quite a bit, uh, particularly for next Sunday. But trusting that your God is here in Jesus, trusting that God is present, uh, and I think that's the that's that's the call here that becomes really uh, important. It's all really good stuff. I, I would also encourage some preachers to look more at verse 13, just given that it's the, the first Sunday in Lent, we might want to talk about the test of Jesus in the wilderness, which hasn't really fit a context up until this point, but that's always the, the Lent one text. But what that means in this case, to speak about him tested by Satan, to be among wild beasts, Mark, of course, totally undernarrates that story in comparison to Matthew and to Luke, but it becomes an interesting way to kick off Lent this year. I think I'll I'll make try to make the case over the next five weeks that we have five texts here that help preachers pull people into the question of why is Jesus crucified or what value could the crucifixion have possibly served, and the text will get at that in different ways. But what I think would be signaled here in just that single verse in verse 13 is that Jesus is going to be crucified because he has embraced an, a, a particular understanding of his identity, his purpose, uh, his role, and that that is one that is contrary to the other destructive spiritual forces that hold sway in this world. And so to start to pull people into that, uh, you'll have really different texts the next four Sundays, but this is, a, I think, an important one for understanding at least the synoptic look on uh, on the crucifixion. So I have three I think... questions about verse 13 for you, Matt. Okay, all in a row. It's just like speed round, double points, bring them. Uh, Are they multiple choice? True Paraxomenos, traditionally translated as tempted, but you helpfully translated it as tested. Yes, I did. Next question. Wild beasts, what the heck? I want a sermon on he was with the wild beasts. What is a therion? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I can answer that if you'd like. Uh, I am. I only ask questions I don't know the answer to. Well, it's most, um, most interpreters fall in one or two places on that in my reading. It, one is the wild beasts were there and they were threatening. Uh, and fortunately, the angels were there, and he narrowly escaped what was uh, a horrible content, a horrible set of circumstances to be. And that not only was he being tested by by Satan, but also there were real threats against his 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 self. So you see Therion in some Septuagint translations. What's the text about? Is this in Isaiah about the road back to Zion? There will be no wild beasts there as part of it. That this idea of of for peace to happen these dangerous aspects of creation have to be pushed aside or, or banished in some way. But what's going on here is Mark is accentuating the risk. The other possibility is it's more of a peaceable kingdom kind of thing, that this is like you know, lion and lamb lying down together, that Jesus goes to the wilderness and part of what he does, I think Mark wants us to assume he passes the test, even though we don't get the full narration. But also he's lying down with jackals next to him, and, and sleeping through the night because creation is starting to get remade where those old lines of predator and prey are starting to fall apart. So take your pick. I love that. I like the second one better. Um, 
a, 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 fr a special friend tells me that Isaiah 35 is the first I was thinking of. No lion will be there. Um, that's uh, that's from Ben, who produces the podcast. Only the redeemed will walk there. I uh, it, but it does call the text. It does call to image the uh, the the peaceable kingdom from Isaiah 11. That uh, and it also calls to mind the. So it's either calls to mind that that Jesus is starting to bring in this thing where creation itself is being transformed. That that's Isaiah 11, or that's the other one possibility, one be, right? Yeah, or the other one would be more like Daniel in the lion's den. Exactly. And so um, I, because I, I love Isaiah more than Daniel, am an Isaiah guy. But I, that's, you know, I think that that's uh, really interesting because as I was thinking about, and I'm so glad we're focusing on uh, verses 12 and 13. Because uh, when we think about that reality of that threat that is that is near him and or next to him, lying next to him, that it it helps us, I think, have a different perspective on the voice from the heavens. That the voice from the heavens is, of course, the it, it's this you know first it's the second person singular, so it's Jesus hears this voice, um, but it's not just for the sake of his identity. Um, and, and being affirmed in that identity, but it's it, to what extent Jesus remembers and needs that voice going into the wilderness, uh, that, that that voice that of telling him who he is and the relationship he has with God and what his ministry is going to be uh, is something that that uh, on upon which he draws in that in that wilderness time. And that I think has a lot of implications for preaching. And then the other promise of the wilderness, if you will, or the reality of the wilderness that I think really does then, how does that then affect Jesus going into his ministry is the, he was served, it's not waited upon, but served and uh, served by the, present, by the presence of the angels. And, and at the very end of chapter 10, uh, 1038, that's exactly how Jesus describes his own ministry. Mm -hmm. I came not to serve, but to, not to um, be served, but to serve. And so this is a really critical moment in that it's identity forming and identity making. It's not just that he passed a test, but something happens here that he hears that voice and also experiences uh, th this presence of God in such a way that it carries him forward to articulate and understand what his own ministry is about. Uh, I realize that as a very uh, human Jesus there, but I think that that's, that's what's going on. And in the echo of uh, the, uh, I, I love, uh, Matt, where you talk about uh, Jesus coming into uh, the being of who he is. Um, and uh, um, I can't remember, Ralph or Caroline, you talked about the communal nature of, of this. Uh, in the echo of the story that um, Mark truncates, um, but is the familiarity of, of those who would be those first readers, uh, those the first hearers of, of this incident, um, the echo of what it means to be in the wilderness for uh, ancient Israel, to be in this place that is supposed to be leading to promise, and yet this is the place of greatest danger, uh, um, maybe even more danger than the oppression that we had previous, previously been in. I think of that in the, um, the, the reality of our contemporary moment. Um, is the moment that we're current, currently in a moment that is leading to promise and yet no less risky than the danger we think we just left. And I think uh, as I read uh, verse 12, I want to highlight the fact that Jesus doesn't go in alone, that Jesus is uh, surrounded by, uh, driven by, that, that Jesus is um, in the hand of the Spirit. Uh, uh, as as Jesus goes into this this wilderness, into this danger zone, into this um, this in betweenness uh, that we will be rehearsing uh, for the next forty days uh, uh, between what is and what the promise says we will uh, receive, that we we go 
and the community of a people who have shared an ancient story that has sustained us for generations. And we go in the hand of the Spirit of God who promises to be with us because God is pleased with us. Good stuff. No shortage of, uh, of Mark 1. Preaching points. Every year B, when we get to Lent, if we were ready to move to Genesis, every year B, I, I get really excited because I go, why in the world is the rainbow in here? And then I think, oh, they're going to give us five weeks on covenants. And then I look ahead for a couple of weeks and I think, yeah, we're going to get like five weeks on great covenantal passages in the Old Testament. And then like weeks four and five, I think they just kind of go away. But at least for a couple of weeks in Lent, you get some great promises that God makes in the Old Testament. I would put the, the Ten Commandments as a covenantal moment as well, but I'll probably get in trouble for saying that in wow. a couple of weeks. But in this case, uh, Rainbow, I established my covenant with you. What a friendly God who just wiped out the whole earth except for one family. As if the idea of cancel culture is a 21st century phenomenon. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, that's I appreciate, a great hook. I really, okay, so let's just stop there. Hold on. Yeah. Gotta let that breathe. That's a great <laughs> hook. How could you not preach on Genesis 9 this week when you get that hook? Cancel <laughs> culture. Take it away, Joy. <laughs> well, actually, I'm. Uh, thank you for that, Ralph. Um, um, but uh, I'm. I'm also leaning into uh, just the recognition of of being careful, uh, as the uh, the commentator uh, uh, suggests, of being careful of how we do read this text. Matt, you just alluded to it. Uh, what is the reality that this promise is being made in? Um, and it's being made in a context where, on the one side, we have to just uh, acknowledge how this text has been used to approve of genocide, uh, of marginalization, of oppression. Or on the other side, and this this has to do with our willingness to judge and to cancel, is there some behaviors, is there some um, acts that are so oppressive, uh, so um, dehumanizing for the community or the culture at large, that what is required is for that um, at the hand of God. And I'm not going to say that God's going to wipe us out by uh, a flood or a famine or a disease, and I want to say that on purpose, um, but uh, the idea going back to the idea of, of what we really mean by repent, uh, going back to the gospel, that if our hearts are changed, that that would be the way that we live into the covenant of God, where the peace and the promise of peace is a reality. I think that's a different way of looking at both the destruction um, and the fact that we're so willing to cancel. And it goes back to what you've already said, Rolf, um, last week when we were, uh, or when we were talking about Ash Wednesday, we're so willing to point the finger at other people. Are we willing to accept this as the promise made to us if we are willing to repent? It's, um, I, I want to pick up uh, what I took as your hook, but first of all, I was, I am not aware of this text, Genesis 9, this part of it being used uh, in the ways that uh, the, the commentator talks about it. I'm not disagreeing it. I'm just saying I learned something, although I would have appreciated examples of it. I mean, I think that in, of the Genesis texts, the mark of Cain or the Sodom and Gomorrah story have much more been used that way broadly in, in ways that are recognizable. But I accept, uh, I accept the, the, the lesson in but this is the original culture can, can, uh, cancel, cancel culture text because God decides to cancel the whole culture, every human. Why? Because we really suck. There's something inside us that's part of our nature. Go back to Genesis 6, where it says, 
every thought of the human heart is nothing but continually evil. Um, Matt's explanation of reformed um, uh, anthropology of sin has always been helpful to me. Uh, Matt, you probably, you probably only said it to me once, but maybe you just say, what do Presbyterians and other reformed people mean when they talk about the human uh, original sin as, uh, what's the term? Not original sin, but... Total depravity? Yeah, what does total depravity really mean? mean? And if oh, you don't remember question? what you said, I'll say what you said to me, and then you tell me if I remember right. <laughs> you want to know what total depravity means? It, it, it depends who you're who you're talking to. I'm talking to you in the Reformed tradition. Well, it's not an expression I use a lot, but I, I I would say that there's a sense in which human sinfulness infects all of our. Uh, attempts even to do good, and that's both individual and corporate. Uh, we we create systems that try to mitigate the effects of that. Various kinds of checks and balances on power, but we'll always find a way. Uh, I will always find a way. Our societies will always find a way to persecute our neighbor. I think, I and mean, that's 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 at least how I describe it in a twenty first century vein. Yeah, it's. Um... So that's Genesis 6. God looks and sees that, that there's no part of our, it's not that we don't have good in us or try to do good, but that there's no part of our being that is not somehow compromised by the reality of sin. And God, God's internal sense of justice is so innate to God that God considers canceling the whole culture, but finds something lovable and enduringly good in Noah and Noah's family. And so God, I, the, I love the idea of these, uh, these um, covenantal texts. Start here, this is a, be a great Lenten theme, and then next week, uh, Genesis, and then the following week, um, uh, the Ten Commandments. Uh, but so, and then, then, we, then we can make up some more to substitute. Uh, I have a few weeks to do that now, but the promise here, every covenant has a sign in the Old Testament and a promise. So you have a problem. What's the problem? Human sin. Then you have uh, a promise and a sign of the promise. And uh, the sign is not to remind us of the promise. It's to remind God I, in this covenant, God is overcoming something in God's self that would call for the cancellation of the culture, and that is God's sense of justice. But it's a very close thing. God's sense of justice still endures, but God's sense, God's sense of fidelity and mercy and love um, just slightly rules the day. And I think it's at that moment that God decides the cross will be the ultimate answer to sin, not canceling the culture, which is why it's such a great Lenten theme. I love that, Ralph. Uh, there's, there's also, um, I, I heard um, uh, 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 this this past year, this idea of, of a God who knows when enough is enough. And, and so the God who in creation knew how far to tell the waves to come up on the land and, and um, uh, you know, everything that was done was enough food for all of humanity and all the animals uh, to be able to, to survive. Uh, the, the, in creation, what God is creating is enough for abundant life, if we will trust God. And the entrance of this disobedience and doubt against God in the opening story is repeated again and again as God is faithful to the original promise to the first couple that um, your disobedience is not going to um, uh, end my creational intention for good. And uh, God has to keep I, I dared use that word. God has to keep the descendant of Adam and Eve, this time the great great grandson Noah, uh, in order to keep that original promise 
to the first couple. Uh, because to just to cancel all of culture is to cancel the promise. So the faithfulness of God is evident in a God who knows when enough for creating beauty and life, but God also knows when enough is enough in destruction. And this was enough destruction. This was enough canceling. It wasn't total because what is total is God's faithfulness to keep uh, that creational intention of abundant life for humanity. And I, and I think if that's the uh, direction that you decide to go, then this, then the Psalm is exceedingly helpful. If I can just take us there. I uh, wait, oh, Matt, you have something else to say? I just say a couple quick things about Genesis. It's, there's these strings hanging there that are driving me crazy. I, I want to just like make sure they get tucked in someplace. Uh, and, and one is, um, there's a lot of stuff about total depravity that's totally bonkers, just so you know, in terms of like, you know, the heirs of Calvin and what they wrote. But but it's not just divine justice, I think, that chooses. There's also something utterly peculiar about God's desire to stick with hum the human project, so to speak. Right? There's just something a little bit nutty uh, about God's uh, holding out hope or holding out a commitment to that, which is why I think these covenantal texts are so beautiful. And the other quick thing, I think what the commentator online, Justin Reed, was talking about was uh, verses 18 and following the curse of Ham in terms of a, of a passage that's had. So if some of our listeners are wondering, like, wait, what? What are we talking about? What are the, the, the things in the passage? I think it's that in terms of a, a text that's done uh, incredible damage in terms of declaring a divine curse on, on folks. But um, other than that, Psalm 25. Loving kindness, covenants again. Look at that. Well, yeah, there's the covenants again. Uh, yeah, covenants. Uh, yeah, but it it's also that uh, uh, be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. And so it's a really a, a restatement of what of what we've been saying. And and I, Ralph, what you said about the 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 fact that you know, intrinsic to God, inherent to God is this justice and this human project that if that becomes uh, something that you, that you take forward or that you uh, think about homiletically, even tying, uh, tying some of these texts together, that's in part what Jesus experiences is in the wilderness uh, with the presence of God. And then the only other time um, wilderness, the other, the other significant clump of wilderness language in Mark is uh, around the feeding of the 5,000, mm -hmm. uh, where you have, uh, they're in the desert and, and the disciples are like, you know, send the crowd away and then no, Jesus feeds the 5,000, which is again, Jesus' own embodiment of this commitment to, uh, commitment to God's steadfast love. And so, uh, yeah, I th it just uh, the the language of the psalm, I think, can really give you give the preacher the vocabulary to uh, uh, to unpack this and how the psalmist uh, itself uh, recognizes this characteristic of God. Yeah, I um, I, the reason I brought up total depravity, Matt, was because I think Lutherans have traditionally misunderstood. Uh, the view, and I found your correction so helpful. Um, um, maybe when Lutherans were misunderstanding it, they were reading the heirs of Calvin that misunderstood it. So uh, maybe it's just not that we're mean-spirited misreaders of other oh, people's yeah. traditions. Although, I mean, there's hey, some people who believe that like cognitively, like that just our whole ability to know is somehow stained by the fall. I mean, it's I get where that's coming from, but then finally it-, it Based it on my of... interaction with a lot of Calvinists, I think that's probably accurate. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, joke people, don't write me. Um, and in that joke, that's why I'm a Wesleyan, but- <laughs> Exactly. Um, I, I, I don't like the language of a, a human project or the human project. Um, I like the language of Mark, the kingdom of God, that the, the alternate reality, that it's not, because it is all about all of creation. Like you get the angels 
and creation serving him. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to throw that in. And I know that you didn't mean that by uh, that language, but let's just bring it back full circle. Although we'll say the Psalm is a great song, right? This is one of the great uh, kind of new camp songs to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And so people might wanna um, be reminded of that, but uh, I really think the focus uh, of these uh, of this week is on these covenant, the idea of covenant and the idea that we uh, spun out so, uh, I thought pretty helpfully in the conversation about all the directions from Mark one. We're at 30 minutes. So, no first Peter. Let's do first Peter. You're gonna have to edit this out, Lara, my uh, inelegant, uh, <laughs> but just so you know, we are at 30 minutes. Will do. First Peter, Matt. Me? Uh, well, speaking, I, I used the word bonkers earlier. This this passage feels a little bonkers at time. Like, wait a minute, what? Spirits in prison? I mean, of course, doctrines have been spun out of this that we probably don't have time for. But I do really appreciate that uh, Young Sook Kim had focused in on that, 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 that little phrase in verse 18, to bring you to God. And just that image uh, of, of being brought to God as opposed to making a way for you to approach God or forgiveness of sins or I mean the kinds of language that's all got its place in our theology in the New Testament but just this little a little line is is dramatic and um, you could even stop reading right there I guess if you want to but I think the lectionary committee wants to make a tie to Noah and that may or may not be helpful, which the flood is about baptism, of course, Caroline, just so you know, it says so right here in first Peter. But um, I just wanted to highlight that for people wondering what to what to do with this text, or maybe if you find it interesting to spend a little bit of time on that, uh, the idea of being ushered into the divine presence, or carried. <laughs> 